people so much for coming out tonight on such a beautiful evening as well. Uh, we're honored to be hosting our speaker this evening. Uh, she's a Canadian naturopathic doctor, an educator, and an author. She's an expert on natural health, and she speaks internationally as well as across Canada on television, television and radio. She's the author of the best-selling book, Vitamin K2, The Calcium Paradox, How a Little Known Vitamin Could Save Your Life. Here to share her knowledge tonight is Dr. Kate, Kate Brayon Blue. <laughs> Thanks everyone. I am, have to say I'm actually thrilled to see so many people out here tonight on this beautiful evening, but you're still here taking steps to improve your own health, so I'm delighted about that. I um, also wanted to, to just do like a little bit of a poll or ask some questions to find out what drew you out tonight, why you're here, and what you came to learn. So who is here because you have concerns around bone health? Okay. How about heart health? Okay. Cholesterol, when it's important, when it's high or low. Should you take the drugs or not take the drugs? Worried about whether you should take the drugs? Okay. All right. All right. Um, okay. Anything else? Things that you were hoping to learn about tonight? Okay. That's good. Not have calcium develop in your muscles or. How to not have calcium develop in your muscle or tendons or inappropriate places. Okay, that's absolutely what we're going to speak about. Okay, that's, so this is good. I like when people say things that are on point and not random things. So um, we'll talk about all of that. Let me do another poll before we get started. Who here is taking vitamin D? Okay. Who here is taking calcium? Okay, so I have some good news for you and some bad news. Which do you want first? Bad. 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 I think bad was louder. All right, so we're going to do bad news first. It's a little bit of bad news, and then lots of good news. We can all go home feeling happy. The bad news, and this is uh, starts for the calcium supplement takers, but extends to all of us vitamin D takers as well. I want to get into that because it really is important. Is uh, you may have heard that studies have shown that people who take uh, calcium supplements have 20 to 30 percent more heart attacks and strokes than people who don't take calcium supplements. Never heard. You've never heard. Okay, so let's do a poll. So who's heard of this information? Who's heard of these studies? Okay, maybe half. Who hasn't heard of these studies? Another half. Okay, so even in a group of people, you're obviously keen, you're obviously interested in learning. There's all this is a topic of importance to you, and you still haven't heard this information. Why is this? It's not just one study, it's several at this point that suggest this trend. And the reason that this information really hasn't got the coverage it deserves is because ultimately it's confusing, right? Because, first of all, most of us are taking calcium, for the people who are taking calcium, we'll get to vitamin D in a minute, because our doctors have told us to do so, right? Even a doctor who won't recommend a multivitamin will recommend calcium and vitamin D. It's almost commonplace that all women should just do this, okay? And so then to think that actually it may be causing harm that ends up being very confusing. Because then what do we do? Well, do we just stop taking calcium? Well, what about our bones? Um, you know, that's serious too. It becomes very confusing. I had a person, actually this is more than one person, but very typical, I had a lecture recently. This woman said to me, she said, my osteoporosis specialist told me under no circumstances should I take a calcium supplement. My GP said, he's crazy, you need to take calcium. And this is a woman's two doctors with very strong opinions. So the point is, Actually, it's okay to be confused about this because it is confusing. Because ultimately, <coughs> we're seeing this problem with calcium. What we're seeing is that we take calcium supplements, and a portion of that will go to our bones where we want it, but some of it ends up lining the arteries, leading <coughs> to hardening of the arteries, which leads to heart attacks and strokes. And if you're not taking calcium supplements, you may think, okay, no problem. But the thing is, is that we also see this arterial laden calcification in the, in the arteries, uh, calcified uh, uh, plaque. Even if you don't take calcium supplements, calcium supplements seems to make it a bit worse, but whether or not you take calcium supplements, this is the leading cause of death of both men and women in North America. So we have a problem with calcium. It can get into the wrong places. It's a double-edged sword. We need calcium in our body, but we need it to be in the right places. And if it gets in the wrong places, it could potentially be deadly. It also builds up in less deadly areas like muscles and joints and breast tissue. Um, but it also it can build up in, in dangerous areas like heart valves and uh, heart arteries, coronary arteries, carotid arteries, and things like that. And if we only just looked at calcium, 
and try to figure out what's going on. Or if we blame calcium, we're never going to understand. So in other words, the question, are calcium supplements safe? Well, that's actually a decent question we can talk about later if you want. But um, whether or not calcium is safe, calcium is always in our bodies. The point is we haven't always had a problem of getting it in the right place the way we do now. And so we really want to understand um, how we get calcium to go where it should and not where it doesn't because we actually have a system to deal with. So this is something I call the calcium paradox, this sort of paradoxical situation in which calcium can get into the wrong places, but it's not calcium's fault. So calcium is a mineral, and minerals are almost just about like tiny microscopic rocks really on, on a certain level. And by that I mean they're not dynamic. They don't move around of their own accord. What moves minerals around the body is actually fat-soluble vitamins. So the reason, for example, that we all take vitamin D with our calcium is vitamin D causes us to absorb more calcium. Now, to a certain extent, that's good if you're trying to absorb more calcium. But after the calcium is absorbed, vitamin D has no control over where that goes. So some of it may end up in the bones, but some of it may end up in other places. And as a matter of fact, I hear this all the time. So vitamin D, the more you take it, the more it will just make you absorb more and more calcium. And I know some people now are on the mega dose high vitamin D bandwagon. And I've, I hear from people, uh, this is potentially deadly. People die from this. Um, I know because they email me about it. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> so one person in particular, for example, um, he was taking 50,000 IUs of vitamin D per day, and after six months, it, you know what, it sounds crazy, but there are lots of people doing this. There are books out there suggesting that you do this, and a lot of people are on it. I had, so this, so this particular person was 50,000 IUs of vitamin D per day for six months, and he had a massive heart attack managed to survive, to email me at least once. Uh, I didn't hear from him again after that, unfortunately. But uh, to say that the doctor said they'd never seen the kind of calcification in and around his, all of his arteries that they had seen with this person. Recently, I got an, in, an email from an individual who's taking 80,000 IUs a day, and he's thinking of boosting it up to 100,000 IUs a day. So people are out there taking these levels of vitamin D. Now, on a less extreme level, I hear from people who are taking 10,000 IUs of vitamin D a day. That doesn't seem really crazy, right? And yet I can think of, you know, just one couple weeks ago, this happened, this comes up all the time. She said, I've been doing this for three years, and then I just found out that my calcium score, and we'll talk about this, is very high, and that my carotid arteries are full of calcium. She says, otherwise I can't figure out what's going on. So the point is that vitamin D will make you absorb calcium, but then after that has no control over where it goes. But we've always had this problem because we always have calcium in relatively high amounts in our bodies all the time. We need that for our heart to beat, for our muscles to function, for our nerves to function. But we've also always had a system to make sure calcium doesn't harm us. But that system has been failing, and I'll explain why. It's essentially due to lack of the nutrient that controls that system, which is where vitamin K2 comes in. So vitamin D will make you absorb calcium. Vitamin K2 will make sure the calcium goes where it's supposed to. Talk about that. So let's just touch on very briefly. So we've got this calcium paradox. We've decided the creation where calcium is and it uh, should be and it's not in the bones, and where it is and it shouldn't be in our arteries. So we'll talk about that. That's um, the heart health side of things. Like I said, calcium can build up in all kinds of interesting areas. But let's just talk about heart health because that's the most deadly. When we talk about heart health, a lot of the discussion around heart health for so long has been around cholesterol, right? Um, you know, if your cholesterol is high, get it lowered. If you uh, if you know, to have tests for it and try. For a while, we talked about eating foods to avoid cholesterol, but now we understand that you eat less cholesterol, and your body's just going to make more. And the cholesterol you eat really doesn't contribute to your blood levels of cholesterol. But sometimes I do a version of this talk that's called the truth about cholesterol, because there's a lot of confusion and, and misinformation about this. And uh, the fact is that 50% of people who have heart attacks have normal cholesterol levels at the time of their heart attack and no history of ever having had high cholesterol. So this is concerning because many of us uh, may go to the doctor and have our cholesterol checked and if it's normal you think, great, I'm not at risk for heart disease. But 50% of people who have heart attacks didn't have high cholesterol. So high cholesterol is in fact um, 
you know, cholesterol levels are not a great predictor of your risk of heart disease. For, you know, you've also heard that there's good and bad cholesterol, right? So you can't look at total cholesterol. And even the so-called bad cholesterol doesn't become bad until it's oxidized or damaged. And we'll touch on that a little bit at the end, how you can stop that from happening. So inflammation can cause your cholesterol to go up. Cholesterol is actually an anti-inflammatory, so cholesterol goes up in an attempt to soothe that inflammation. And if it fails to soothe that inflammation, a process can start that leads to plaque, which leads to heart attack, and cholesterol gets the blame. But cholesterol is like, blaming cholesterol for heart attacks and strokes is a little bit like blaming firemen for the fire. So we, we really got off track there. So cholesterol, high LDL, which is the so-called bad cholesterol, is an okay predictor of your risk of heart disease for men between the ages of about 40 and 60. Uh, beyond that, not as good a predictor. For women, the connection between cholesterol and heart attack, not a good one. When it comes to looking at your cholesterol results, and as a woman deciding whether you should take a statin, I really, um, really use a lot of caution there. For people over the age of 60, slightly elevated cholesterol is associated with a lower risk of both heart disease and dementia. It seems to have a protective effect. So if you're a woman and you're over even 60, I would, I don't think, I don't know if there's ever uh, an incidence when I would take a statin. Actually, there is one. So also one very important thing to know if you're deciding whether or not you should take a statin is statins, while we're on this, and I mention this because there's a lot of confusion. People are pres being prescribed them, sometimes very forcefully. They don't feel comfortable with taking them. They don't know what to do. Statins are not good at primary prevention, which means that, I'm not here to bash drugs necessarily, but the facts are that if you have not had a heart attack, a statin medication will not change your risk of having a heart attack. So if you compare people who have and haven't taken statins, the risk of having a heart attack is the same. So that's what's called primary prevention. Now, if you've already had a heart attack, statins are not bad at what's called secondary prevention of helping reduce your risk of having a next heart attack. I think there's other ways of doing it because they have their side effects. But the point is that for primary prevention, if you've never had a heart attack, I don't think there's a good reason to take a statin medication. Okay, so is that uh, clear? Is that answer some questions about statins, cholesterol, okay, good. So let's get back to, so let's get back to if cholesterol isn't a good predictor of your risk of heart disease, then what is? Well, it turns out the presence of calcium in your arteries is an excellent predictor of your risk of heart disease. And there are tests that can measure this. Um, there's called a coronary artery calcification scan or EBT, electron beam tomography. Um, and it's a specialized type of, of scan, the CT scan you can have done that will image the beating heart in still. It will measure the presence of calcium that's in the three major arteries that feed the heart, the coronary arteries, and represent that volume, of the actual amount of calcium to you as a number. And that number is very predictive of your risk of having a heart attack within five years of that test. It's, it's not a crystal ball, but it's really close. Now this is a test, you know, I'm, I'm from uh, back east and I know in the Toronto area we can drive down to Buffalo and get this pretty easily. Uh, and there may be imaging centers near here where you can do that, you can check that out. Some places in the States, uh, and I hear from a lot of Americans, and I know they're American when they email them with their calcium score, because that's very common for people to get that there. They can get these tests for like 150 bucks, um, but which is harder for us to access that. So you can look into that if you're interested. So let's say, you get the test and you find your calcium levels or your calcium score is high. Then what do you do? Or let's say you can't get the test and you don't know that you've been taking calcium supplements. Or let's say you haven't been taking calcium supplements, but you're a 50-year-old male, you're fit, you're healthy, you're jogging, but you have a family history of heart disease. Um, the point is, if you don't know what's going on there, or even if you do, what can you do about it if there's calcium building up or it should be? And the very good news is it can be prevented and even reversed. And uh, it's not magic, it sounds incredible, because we always think of heart disease as the silent killer, it's just gonna sneak up on us and get us. But it's not, it's just a failure of a system. We've always had to deal with this. So, this system relies on a series of proteins. So we have these series of proteins that are in our body all the time, and what they do is they circulate looking for calcium, and when they find it building up in an area that it shouldn't be, they scavenge and clear the calcium away and clear it out of the body. But those proteins that are supposed to be doing this 
will only do that once they're activated. They have to be turned on. And what turns them on is vitamin K2. This little nutrient, little known nutrient that was overlooked for a long period of time, and I'll explain why, it's a case of mistaken identity. This is what this does. It will turn on these proteins, and then they will go and scavenge calcium and take it out of uh, areas. And yes, I have heard from people, now my book's been out for a couple of years, and I've heard from people who um, have had calcium building up in all kinds of areas. One email recently, an airline pilot had aortic stenosis, it's a, a buildup of calcium on the uh, aortic valve in the heart. Uh, his license was revoked because he can't fly with this kind of condition. He started on vitamin K2 and emailed me a few weeks ago to say that he had a repeat echo. His cardiologist told him his, his uh, heart valve was completely normal and he's writing a letter to have his license, license reinstated with the FAA because his, his heart valve was normal. Um, another one uh, not too long ago, these kinds of stories of calcium building up on all areas that can absolutely be reversed. And I have to admit, despite the research, I wasn't expecting that when I wrote the book. And I wouldn't be ta here talking about this, or, or I'm certainly not in, in uh, wanting to give anybody false hope or, or make guarantees on any kind of health condition. But I've had so much feedback at this point that I know that it's happening the way the study suggested that it should. So we have this system. But the system only works when vitamin K2 comes in and activates it. Um, I'll explain this, this goopy mess uh, a bit later on. Okay, and that, by the way, applies to calcium building up in all kinds of areas of the body. So that is the side of the equation, very briefly, uh, where calcium is and it shouldn't be. So look at the side of things where calcium isn't and it should be. So our bones, for example. So this is where we all started to take uh, both calcium as well as, uh, in many cases, vitamin D, or certainly the two together. So what happens? Well, the bones are actually, although they are very solid and they seem unchanging, they are quite dynamic. They're changing all the time. Our bones are constantly being broken down. That little, little holes uh, are, are formed in the bone. There are cells that break the bone down and make a little hole. And there's other cells that come in and fill in those holes. And the, the process of bone breakdown and bone building should be roughly equal to maintain the bone density. This is how old bone is replaced with new, fresh, healthy bone. It's how we heal fractures. And this process is happening all the time. When osteoporosis sets in, the process of bone breakdown begins to exceed the body's capacity of building it up. And those holes are left behind. They're not being filled in the way they should be. And the bones become porous and brittle. And that uh, leads to fracture. There's a lot of things in the bone. It's actually, uh, uh, quite a bit of it is what you could consider to be soft tissue or protein. There's a protein matrix in there. And then, of course, as we know, there's minerals, which is what makes that hard. And lots of minerals in here, but the main one that's missing is, of course, calcium. And so because calcium is a big one that's missing, the idea was, well, if calcium's missing, take more calcium. And the fact is, as I was saying before, we actually have a lot of calcium in our bodies all the time. If it's missing from your bones, it's not because you're not taking enough in generally. It's extremely rare. But uh, the point is that calcium's not staying where it should. But anyway, the idea was we'll take a, a little bit of calcium. And that seemed to be helpful. And if a little bit of calcium is good, then more must be better. So take 1,000 and 1,200 and 1,500 milligrams of calcium, right? Whopping doses of calcium. We're just not meant to absorb and metabolize this much calcium, really. And then there's, so, and because that's so difficult to absorb, there's all this talk of, well, what's the best type of calcium, right? If you just get the right type of calcium, it'll do good and no harm. And when should you take it? And should you take it with or away from certain things? And it's very complicated when it comes to calcium. And that's because we're just really not meant to be absorbing and metabolizing so much of this mineral. And uh, so still, when uh, people were um, uh, starting to take calcium and vitamin D together, it did seem to be helpful for the bones, but now we're starting to see this big downside. So again, ultimately, vitamin D, as I was saying, will help us absorb more calcium. But it won't necessarily guide it into the bone. So these other, these other proteins that circulate, and they'll take calcium, and they'll drive it into your bones. But again, only when vitamin K2 is there to make it do its job. So vitamin K2 um, has been shown to help improve bone density. A, a handful of uh, studies out at this point. It's early in K2 research. You know, we're about a couple decades behind vitamin D anyway. But the studies are already there. And vitamin K2 and D have been shown to work better together than either nutrient alone. They do a number of things. Instead of just absorbing and moving calcium, they affect uh, the levels of our bone breakdown and build up in a number of different ways. 
So for some people, it can be the missing piece to the puzzle for bone health. There can be lots of different things going on actually with bone health, but for some people, it can really be the missing piece of the puzzle. And also important to say, we know that women tend to suffer with osteoporosis more than men. Men can absolutely get osteoporosis, but women tend to suffer uh, because when estrogen levels decline in menopause, which they're supposed to, that's normal, that can potentially negatively impact the bone health in three different ways. I won't get into those. But long story short, vitamin K2 has been shown to counteract each of those changes to compensate for the bone loss that can be seen in menopause. Okay, so. Now we know a little bit about K2, some of the basic things that it does, and it seems very common sense once you realize that we need this system to keep calcium in check. How come we haven't heard about it till now? How come I'm still one of the only people talking about it? It's the only you know, really book about it. Um, how is this? How has this been overlooked, especially with everything we know about vitamin D? And and that is, as I was saying, due to a case of mistaken identity, and that is because. When you say vitamin K, vitamin K is really a family of vitamins, it's like the B vitamins, right? You would never say to somebody, take some vitamin B, because there's a bunch of them. You need to know which one you're talking about. Same thing, fortunately, with the K vitamins, there's really just two. It makes it much simpler. Uh, two that are uh, concern us for our health, K1 and K2. They were discovered at the same time. The people who discovered them won a Nobel Prize for their discovery. But there were some... Um, Assumptions that were made at the time that were inaccurate that led us to ignore vitamin K2 for a long time. So vitamin K1 uh, is a nutrient that's involved in blood clotting. And as you may have heard, it comes from which dietary sources? Vitamin K1. Leafy greens. greens, exactly. Everybody knows that. Right. And, um, but it's so important for blood clotting, it cannot be left to the whims, like your intake can't be left to the whims of uh, dietary uh, restrictions, right? So you can't afford to bleed to death because you haven't eaten a salad this week or broccoli. You know? And so the body has a system of recycling vitamin K1, so you always have it. Even if you only eat the parsley on the side of your plate once in a while, you will always have enough vitamin K. It's almost impossible to be deficient in vitamin K1, and the deficiency is almost never due to inadequate intake. So when it happens, it's due to liver disease or some secondary problem. And so researchers figured that out. And they also saw this other form of the nutrient, vitamin K2. They're like, eh, it's similar to K1. They figured, eh, K1, K2, that's it. They're blood clotting vitamins. We can't be deficient pretty much, so that's the end of the story. And that was wrong. Vitamin K2, in fact, does not participate in blood clotting under normal circumstances. There's an exception to that, but I'll tell you. It does not come from green leafy vegetables. And most importantly, we don't recycle it which means that if you're not getting vitamin K2 in your diet on a regular basis, you will become deficient in it. But the deficiency isn't obvious. If you're deficient in vitamin K1, it's obvious because you're going to start to bleed or bruise or you know, you're going to have a, a, a visible problem. But the deficiency in vitamin K2, what does that mean? Um, studies have shown that most apparently healthy adults are in fact deficient in vitamin K2. We've heard this kind of thing with vitamin D, right? The vitamin D deficiency is widespread. Uh, and you may think, well, if you can be apparently healthy and deficient in vitamin K2, then who cares? But the key here, the word is, is apparently. Because you can be apparently healthy, but slowly your bone density is eroding. Or slowly you've got plaque filling up in your arteries. Or slowly, for example, because vitamin K2 also plays a role in cell growth regulation. We hear that in cancer. Uh, so cancer cells can start growing out of control, especially prostate and, and lung. Um, so the problem is that you can have these problems that can go on, insidious, uh, for decades before you may have a sign or a symptom of it. It's not always clear what's going on in the B2 deficiency. So how did this get to be? So how did deficiency become widespread? We can, we can speculate the vitamin D deficiency became widespread for a number of reasons, the main one of which is that we spend most of our time covered up and clothed. So that seems pretty obvious if it's the sunshine clothing. But what about vitamin K2? How can it be deficiency be so widespread if we're all eating different things? Uh, you know, you think you see different levels of it. Well, there's two dietary sources of vitamin K2. There are, uh, first of all, animal foods. So where do we get this in the diet? Animal foods, but more so, and this is, by the way, fat-soluble vitamin, remember? So this comes in the fat, egg yolks, butter, the fat uh, of, of 
of certain types of animals, but more so when those animals are fed on grass. So this is called the grass-fed vitamin, because the amount of vitamin K2 in your food will increase with the amount of grass in the animal's diet. And not to make things complicated, but at certain times the rate the grass is growing, but I won't get into that. The point is, uh, it's the grass-fed vitamin. And so, for example, you will find, uh, the reason why we're not all completely uh, deficient in vitamin K2 all the time, uh, to the point of death, uh, is you'll find a smidgen of vitamin K2 in your regular store-bought, cage, you know, raised egg. A little bit is there. You'd have to eat about a dozen of those per day to get a worthwhile amount of vitamin K2. Conversely, two grass-fed eggs, you know, at the height of the summer when the oaks are, uh, yolks are lovely and orange, and uh, you know those, those nice, uh, the, the true uh, free-range egg, those, two of those eggs will give you a worthwhile amount of vitamin K2 for your daily intake. Uh, same thing with, with butter. Regular butter does have a teensy bit of vitamin K2 in it, but grass-fed butter, if you can find it, has extremely high amounts. So when we removed animals from the pasture, about 100 years ago or so, and confined them to grain feeding, we really eliminated, or our vitamin K2 intake took a big hit at the time. So this is one major factor in the decrease in K2 uh, over the last century or so. Now there's another food source, fortunately, because I mean, we all, we know that grass-fed foods are uh, wonderful, they're ideal, they're hard to come by in most parts of, certainly in the country, this country, uh, at most times of the year, maybe not here in Victoria. But there are other sources of vitamin K2 that are more reliable as well in your realm, and that is certain types of fermented foods. So we're eating less fermented foods, which has impacted our K2 intake. The refrigerator has not been our friend in this department. We always talk about eating fresh fruits and vegetables in a diet that's based on fresh foods. We've really only been able to do this since the invention of the refrigerator, right? What did we do before? We weren't eating so many fresh foods. We are eating lots of fermented foods, certainly. So it turns out that some, but not all, bacteria make vitamin K2. And so some, but not all, fermented foods are high in vitamin K2. Some bacteria do this and some don't. So cheeses, for example, uh, particularly brie cheese and gouda cheese are very high in vitamin K2. There are probably others out there. There needs to be more testing done. Um, there is a, uh, yeah, I know, this is, people start getting happy. <laughs> Um, so is this grass-fed And this is the thing, it does not have to be grass-fed That's the thing. It doesn't matter if the milk was grass-fed, it doesn't matter if it was pasteurized, the bacteria make the vitamin K2 and they will do that regardless. And so this is a, it's an important point because I know I've heard a lot of people looking for grass-fed gouda. You just, you know, that doesn't matter, it's the bacteria that make it. Any gouda, as long as it's you know, made with that bacteria, will have vitamin K2 in it. Okay, so let's look at this list, source, food sources of vitamin K2. So we have animal foods, but more so again if they're grass-fed, can't emphasize this enough, especially egg yolks, butter. Goose liver, by the way, actually, this shouldn't be on this list. It doesn't have to be grass-fed. And I'm not mentioning this because I think anybody in here is eating goose liver on an occasional or even regular basis. I mean, uh, you know, some pate de foie gras is nice, right? But it's not a normal thing for us to be eating. Um, but it just, for some strange reason, goose liver is extremely, one of the highest foods, who knows what, and goose in general. I'm guessing goose fat, it hasn't been tested, but it's also high. And then we have certain types of fermented fruits, brie, gouda. Um, so what does this, what does this sound like? Brie cheese, goose liver pate, butter, egg yolks. It's a bit like the French diet, right? Mm -hmm. So remember in the 80s, when we were in 90s even, or on these horrible low-fat diets, supposed to be for heart health, and then they looked around the world and said, who's really heart healthy? Like, oh, the French. Very low rates of heart disease among the French. What are the French eating? The French. <laughs> Should wine be on that list? Rich, creamy, oh, I'll get that. <laughs> Rich, creamy sauces. We could not figure it out what the French was going on with the French. Because they were eating this rich, creamy diet, and they all had extremely low rates of heart disease. And they smoke like chimneys. They should all be dead of heart attacks. And they're not. <coughs> So we couldn't figure it out. Well, this is what we call the French paradox, right? The supposed contradiction between their rich, creamy diet and their low rates of heart disease. What is it about the French? And we said, ah, the red wine. Those Frenchies, they can just you know, eat what they want and wash it down with wine and clears out their arteries. And 
red wine, you know, it's got resveratrol, there's some antioxidants, there's no doubt about that. But it does not have the artery clearing effect that you have with vitamin K2. And the fact is that the French diet is naturally extremely high in vitamin K2. And because they have never moved to the large scale, um, you know, uh, KFO uh, processing of animals, they tend to have smaller scale production of their, their meats and cheeses. Their, their just average diet would be higher in vitamin K2. Okay? So people talk about heart healthy snacks. You know, have some hummus and carrot sticks, or have some like veggies and low fat dip. No, have some brie cheese and a glass of red wine. It's probably the heart healthiest snack. Pair that with a little pate de foie gras. It's probably the um, heart healthiest snack. Excuse me, can I just ask you, are there other fermented foods besides cheese that are good with nature? Yes. So well, the one I have on here, curd cheese, this was Dutch research, and they mentioned curd cheese, and I'm still trying to figure out if this means cottage cheese or those like dry curds that you put on protein or something else. Um, there are likely other foods, and we need to do more testing of those foods. There's one other fermented food, and it's also a plant-based food for the vegans in the audience, that happens to be the highest known food in vitamin K2, and that's natto. N-A-T-T-O. What is that? Natto. is the highest known food of vitamin K2. This is a fermented, let's see here, we've got a picture of natto. This is a fermented uh, soy food, and it is a common breakfast food in Japan. Some, uh, not all of Japan, is being more widely eaten now. So here's the natto. This, uh, these are the natto beans. This is a soybean here and here. And it's held together by these gobs of this kind of stringy, stuffy stuff. Um, who here, here has, has tried natto? Okay, yeah. And who here loves natto? Yeah, I can tell. And I do not want to, you, because the people who love it, love it. Like, her face is lighting up like that. Because the people who love it, love it. And so, and you can read about my adventures of, you know, finding it, and eating it, and trying to, it's, it's very easy to make. You just thaw it and put it on rice, so that's it. That, uh, but people send me their nacho recipes all the time. Please don't send me. Uh -uh. <laughs> I just thought put it on rice. The people who love it, love it. And I'm starting to think it may be like cilantro. It's a love it or hate it kind of thing. But the point is that absolutely try it if you can find it. You can usually get it at Asian grocery stores in these little uh, styrofoam pods. You just thaw it and put it on rice. And it's the highest known food in vitamin K2. There's research showing that people who eat this, so it's a regional thing in Japan, where they eat this, they have higher levels of K2 lower levels of hip fracture, heart disease, all kinds of things. I had an email uh, also very recently from a man, uh, again, down in the States, and he, uh, 63, I think, and he said both his mother and his father and pretty much all of the siblings on all sides of the family died in their mid-60s of heart attacks. And so he was starting to research this, and, and he's been eating natto for the last two years, three years, I think. I think he's eating it every day because he's a natto lover. Uh, tried it and liked it. And his cardiologist, his family doctor said, with your history, we should really send you for a scan to the cardiologist. The cardiologist sent him for a scan. He emailed me to say, the radiologist did the scan, and he wrote zero calcium. And then underneath it, he wrote Z-E-R-O and underlined it and said to him, you tell them this isn't a mistake, because they won't believe me, because we've never seen somebody with no calcium in their arteries. And so, with somebody of that age, just in North America, you wouldn't expect this, and that kind of history of heart disease, and yet his, his arteries were free of calcium. Can I say for sure it was the natto? No. Is it, can we chop it up to anything else? Really hard to say. But the point is that natto can make a big difference, so do try it. Um, it's an experience. Go! <laughs> 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 Yeah, it's, uh, see this lady's eating it on toast? You can see the stringy, it's stringy delicious. strings. <laughs> I see why you like it. It's yeah. not fair. It's not like that. It doesn't do that. It does. You <laughs> stir it, it you, you stir put it, it in rice, and it, yeah. you don't get any string. Uh, the point of stirring it is to make the strings. That's what you told me. No, you got to make the strings. No, the strings are the best part, but it doesn't come out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> She's not eating very nicely, but it could. No. Anyway, get some of your <laughs> breakfast in Japan. Yes, okay. And it was in steamed in a lotus leaf. Very nice, the yes. rice and the yes. natto in between. Okay. Uh, I ate it. Okay, <laughs> I good. Mean, it wasn't bad at all. Uh, so absolutely, by all means, try natto. And I know that 
and, and I still have got lots of it in my freezer. I still eat it from time to time. Um, but many people are going to opt, for example, for a supplement. Um, you know, I love Greek cheese. I can only eat so much of it. Uh, and so this is where supplements come in. So this is this is uh, good information. Let's just say a few more things before we talk about supplements, and then also any other questions that you have as, as we're going along. Um, so in addition to heart disease prevention and reversal, bone health, we talked about dental health. So vitamin K2 plays an important role in oral health and dental health. We don't store vitamin K2 anywhere in our bodies, but when it's present in, in high enough levels, it tends to concentrate in certain areas of the body, and one of those is the saliva gland. And it will essentially squirt vitamin K2 on your teeth, and that keeps your teeth clean. And so many people, when they start with vitamin K2, they'll notice that their teeth feel cleaner, or the hygienist will say, oh, you're flossing more, or something like that. Um, sensitive gums, if you have sensitive gums, uh, pretty much everybody reports that disappears with K2. So I'm starting to actually consider that maybe a sign of vitamin K2 deficiency is, is gum and tooth sensitivity. Um, and uh, great for, for gum and oral health. So that's one area you may actually notice uh, improvements in your health. Because you, the other thing is, with, if your bone density is improving, if your arteries are clearing out, you don't see this. And another area where you may see or notice differences is uh, with varicose veins. Uh, those is, uh, There's a lot of factors that, that factor into varicose veins, but there's some, and if, by the way, if you haven't taken K2 before and you have varicose veins, please take a picture so I can see some more before and after. So I've had great ones, like you had a great one, right, Betsy? Mm -hmm. And uh, and we haven't got the before and after shots because I wasn't expecting it. But anyway, that's that's an area. Also, calcium can build up on the walls or on the elastic tissues in the uh, skin. And when that happens, the skin is less elastic and that can contribute to wrinkles. It's not the only factor in wrinkling, but for this reason, vitamin K2 is, is some anti-wrinkle activity, which is nice. Also, uh, very interesting research recently about prostate health, prostate cancer, prostate enlargement, as well as very, very important prenatal nutrients. So vitamin K2 has been shown to help with uh, facial width, so the development of the baby, uh, helping, with wide, helping uh, develop wide faces, strong teeth, strong bones. And this actually happens all throughout childhood as well. You can help improve uh, facial width and, and facial form. I've got some pictures in my book about that. So a really important prenatal nutrient. Okay, any questions before we start talking about doses and uh, and things like that? Yes? So, um, you mentioned that, for example, someone who's taking the nano and their calcium levels drop to zero mm -hmm. in their arteries, but isn't plaque not just calcium, it's cholesterol, cholesterol and calcium? That's right, and that's an excellent point. You're right, plaque is not just calcium. Um, and vitamin K2 does more than just uh, remove calcium. It has an anti-inflammatory effect, which helps with the plaque development as well. It has actually a plaque stabilizing effect, so it helps, it, it, it sounds contradictory, but that helps prevent the plaque um, from rupturing, which is really when you've got a problem with your plaque. And it does other things as well. And I'm not saying it's necessarily the one and only thing. I like for people who have concerns around heart health to see magnesium in there uh, and curcumin as well. But I, I see, have seen many cases at this point of people who just took K2, or K2 with AMD, and have had their arteries cleared up. And had their arteries cleared up. Cleared up. Along with the, with the cholesterol as well as the calcium? Uh, well, we're not necessarily measuring cholesterol, um, because ultimately the cholesterol levels don't matter. It's um, whether or not you, know, you have an inflammatory process that, that's leading to the plaque development, and K2 is a big part of that. Isn't um, healthy cholesterol necessary to transport healthy nutrients to our brains? Absolutely. I'm not. I'm a big fan of cholesterol, to be honest. It has to be healthy cholesterol. It's relatively easy to keep your cholesterol healthy. We can talk about that. Make sure it doesn't oxidize. And uh, curcumin is a fantastic way to do that. We can, well, we'll touch on that at the end because it is an important part of heart health. Does K2 have a, um, a, a clotting function as well? Good question. It does not under normal circumstances. So normally, all of our clotting proteins are already activated by vitamin K1, so K2 doesn't affect our clotting at all. So it's safe for somebody that like has a stent? Absolutely safe. Is. The only exception is for people who are taking warfarin, because the drug warfarin artificially lowers our K levels, all the K, to prevent clotting. And so when that happens, any kind of vitamin K, K1, K2, from green leafies, from cheese, whatever, that will counteract your medicine. 
Um, so ultimately, you can actually take the two together, and I've had people who do, but you don't get the benefits of either. They just counteract one another, and it's like having your cake and too. So uh, the only exception to that is for people who are on warfarin, then the K2 will counteract the medicine. That does any other blood thinner is fine. Aspirin, Effin, Xeralto, Pradaxa, anything else does not have that interaction. It's just warfarin. Now with statin, what, does, what are the negative or the bad side effects? The, the bad side effects of statins. Statins are known to uh, drastically increase your risk of developing diabetes, uh, muscle wasting, and uh, ironically, it's been shown to um, counteract vitamin K2, decrease your vitamin K2, as well as CoQ10. So there's a, quite a high likelihood of developing long-term problems with statins. of calcium, but then you would probably be uh, want to be more conscious that because your calcium intake is naturally higher than somebody who doesn't have that um, in their water supply, for example, but it's similar to taking a calcium supplement or having additional calcium in your body. So you want to um, just make sure you counteract that and that K2 will have this thing. Yes. This you utilize or they don't know what they can show. Do they have any benefit of eating? I mean, I mean, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, uh, and um, I was told you put the eggshells in the um, blood kefir, because whatever. But is there any other way of benefiting from the eggshell? Uh, I can't say it. I know much about eggshells okay. or how to yeah, derive yeah. the calcium. Is there a relationship between K2 and oxalates? Oh, that's a good question, K2 and oxalates. I think there is, and I've had somebody, actually a Harvard professor who's interested in this particular topic, email me lots of information about it, and um, there seems to be traditional ways of preparing vegetables that are typically high in oxalates that would help counteract that. Uh, so for example, traditional ways of preparing spinach would be with lots of cream and cheese. Uh, those are foods that also have calcium in them, but they also would have vitamin K2 in them, and there seems to be some sort of a mix there that helps to cancel out the oxalates, but at this point, off the top of my head, can't get into any more details on that. Yes. Yeah, I gave my, my son um, <coughs> citrate forms of minerals, because apparently they're supposed to bind to the oxalates, because he has trouble with oxalates. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know if that's going to happen at all. So, um, some, some, and actually, <laughs> it's kind of funny that you mentioned eggshells a second ago. Because what I do sometimes is I grind up eggshells and then I put them in lemon juice to make calcium citrate. Oh, okay. And I give that to him if we're having like high oxalate foods. Right, and acids is another part of, of traditional preparation of those high oxalate foods. There would always be like a squeeze of lemon. Um, so it's interesting that you'll find in traditional food preparation techniques, there ends up being some biochemistry behind it that sort of uh, makes the nutrients most viable. Not a lot, but some. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in regards to that, what about uh, sauerkraut or kimchi? Uh, and then maybe a fermented called liver oil or uh, I guess those would be good. Mm -hmm. So sauerkraut, kimchi, and fermented cod liver oil have all been tested and don't have vitamin K2 in them. It's just, it's a bit of a fluke in terms of which bacteria do and don't. So for example, uh, fermented soy foods. Natto is the highest known food for vitamin K2. Miso and tempeh are fermented soy foods. They have no vitamin K2. So it's, it's a property of the bacteria. Some do, some don't. Slightly moving away from K2, but I, I use quite a bit of soy miso, organic soy miso. Mm -hmm. And I mean, soy has such a bad rap right now. Oh, yes. Uh, so can you just... Yeah, okay, yes, everyone. thank you. So soy has a bad rap, yeah. and for a good reason. I'm not a soy promoter, and a lot of people feel uncomfortable with soy and wouldn't want it at the natural. If you're interested in nacho but want to avoid soy, you can get the nacho bacteria or the nacho itself and culture up your own nacho We're using black turtle beans, works out well, or other types of beans. If it's easy, if you have a yogurt maker, you can do that. Um, fermented soy, however, <coughs> doesn't, like, the, the problematic properties in terms of health properties when it comes to soy are neutralized when you ferment it. So miso, tempeh, natto, and have no concern about that. Then there's the GMO issue, which is something else altogether. But you can find non-GMO organic natto. So, um, but if you're really concerned about that, then you can either make your own from turtle beans or 
uh, you know, go in other directions. So a lot of people are saying that, um, that uh, you know, you go get a miso with, you know, chickpea miso or whatever, but they're really quite expensive compared to soy miso. So yes. I just want organic, or something to them, but, right. so, but you're saying organic soy miso in your case. Um, I don't know if it, uh, by definition it's organic, but there's some, I only know for nacho, you can see like the Japanese organic symbol, which is like three green circles kind of, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that it guarantees it's non-GMO. So, mm -hmm. yes. Well, why do you take vitamin A with B2? Good point. I will, I'll get to that right now. So let me talk a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about doses, if, if you're curious about, if you're looking to take supplements, how much you need to take, what the studies are saying, and then we'll talk a little bit about vitamin A. So did you talk about calcium doses as well? Sure, yes, yeah. I will. Um, yeah, okay. So, so if you are looking at supplements, how much uh, are you looking to take? Let's start with the little ones. Um, kids, I've been giving my kids about 120 micrograms, which is actually one of these with vitamin D. So vitamin K2 is available on its own. Lots of people already have, for example, vitamin D. Or K and D together. It's very convenient. This is what I take because it's just one pill instead of two. Um, uh, children, I've been giving them 120 micrograms once per day uh, since they were about 18 months old. Seems like a high dose for little bodies, but even though, and with most nutrients, you do scale down the dose for the size of their body, but with vitamin K2, yes, their bodies are small, but their bodies are growing and their skeletons are growing, which means they have, relatively speaking, a higher demand for this nutrient. Uh, that extends, by the way, into uh, adolescence, when the hormones kick in and the skeleton really starts to grow, uh, that's been shown to be the highest time in life for uh, vitamin K2 deficiency. So kids in puberty really need extra K2. So my son, he's 11 now, pretty soon I'll, I'll double up his dose and start giving two of these per day. Um, and then into, as well into adulthood, I would say for general health maintenance, 120 micrograms of vitamin K2, so one of these, say, once per day. This is 100 micrograms, this is 120. I don't know why there's a 20 microgram difference. It really makes no difference. One of those a day, good for general health maintenance. If you know you have osteoporosis or osteopenia, I would double that. So it would be like two of these per day. If you know you have uh, arterial calcifications, you could take three, four, five. Vitamin K2 is very safe and non-toxic. The clinical trials right now for reducing arterial calcifications are using roughly the equivalent of about four of these capsules per day, about 500 micrograms approximately. Um, and that would be, by the way, four of those would be about the uh, serve, equivalent of taking one serving of nut. Yes? I, I like the, you know, if you already have vitamin D at home, uh, you can take it separately. And you can absolutely, so all the, the clinical work just looks at vitamin K2 on its own, but I think there's a benefit of having vitamin K and D and a little bit of A that I'll talk about together as well, because vitamin D actually activates uh, and upregulates the K2 protein. So they, they do, there's a synergistic effect, so I like them together. Related to that question, mm -hmm. um, I thought I heard you say a moment ago that vitamin K2 and statins compete. So uh, if, you were, if you were taking statins, would you recommend not taking them and replacing them with vitamin K2? If you haven't had a heart attack, I say there's no point in taking a statin, and that you could replace that with, with vitamin K2. They do different things, of course, but in terms of lowering your heart disease risk, you'd be better off that way. <coughs> it's not that they compete per se, but statins, it seems, have been shown to uh, decrease your K2 uh, levels as, as they do with CoQ10. And then CoQ10, I've also heard. Uh, it starts to mm -hmm. not raise your heart, but it's a fuel for your heart. So your heart's actually running a little, you know, you're on statins and you start doing CoQ10. Mm -hmm. And it's actually like a, uh, how would I say it, wording. It's actually um, increasing, I guess, the, I don't know about the pressure of your heart, but it's under. It's working hard. It's working hard. Yeah, okay, interesting. I, I wasn't uh, aware of that. That's interesting. Okay, so is that, is that clear? I don't know, that was kind of a question, but... Oh, that's kind of a question? Yeah, oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I have to check into that, um, how that works. Uh, but, I mean, I think statins are really pretty overweighted. Yeah, because I'm on uh, 20 mils a day at the crest door. 20, yeah, that's, you know, it, it wouldn't, and that's another thing. If you're going to take a statin, don't take any more than 20, because after that you just get more side effects and, and 
I was still a little off last year. Long story short, I, I brought him in seven days a week. I had a cardiologist, got an angiogram with the with the dye and all that kind of stuff. Said twenty percent blockage, not bad for your age. And plus, plus, and he said, what I would do he said what they found in the states is they actually brought it down to three days a week to seven days a week. Uh, okay. Seems to work with your system, keeping everything in check still and getting rid of a lot of side effects. So you times that over a year. That's a lot less. I'd like to kind of bring it down, introduce it to this, and bring it down to ten, and then maybe five and find that balance. Because the head of cardiologists, the head of doctors, any room that we've seen is like with your family history, your dad's dad, and your dad, and your brother at 50 in good shape construction, one day, boom, gone. Sure. I would suggest you staying on there. They've been proven for a long, long time. So you're you're sure. getting bounced back and forth. Fair enough. And this is this is where like a heart scan is a good real helpful information, right? Compared to just, the angiogram. Oh, well, the angiogram is, is a good one as well, because it tells you what it is. But anyway, yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can yeah. talk about that as well afterwards. So let's go, we'll go back to, um, so doses, that, that's clear in terms of what I was saying there. And, and that's what I was just about to get to. Okay, so types of calcium, doses of calcium, well, let's talk about that. So, I don't recommend a calcium supplement to everybody all the time, as you might imagine. I don't recommend a calcium supplement to all women all the time. Just because you're a woman doesn't mean you need to take calcium. But if you have osteopenia or osteoporosis, there's something to be said for a little bit of extra calcium in your diet, but you don't need much. 500 milligrams a day supplemental is enough. Um, the Japanese are notoriously heart healthy and bone healthy, and yet they have extremely low calcium intakes in their diet. Whereas in North America, we have quite high calcium intakes and more bones are suffering. There's, there's not a correlation in that department, is what I'm saying. So um, so this, for example, I really like this combination, calcium to magnesium. So this is the whole earth and sea pure food bone structure. It has per daily dose, which is three tablets, 300 milligrams of calcium. Doesn't sound like a lot, but you really don't need very much. It also has magnesium. You know, we, we've not even touched on yet magnesium. I'm not sure we'll have a lot of time to get into it, but calcium and magnesium are like yin and yang, salt and pepper, night and day, you know, they're good buddies. They need to come together. So this has that. It has vitamin K2 in it, but Health Canada limits us. Um, I'd like to see more in this, but Health Canada caps us out in terms of how much you can put in a supplement. has vitamin D in it. Again, also I'd like to see more, but Health Canada puts a cap on how much you can put in a supplement. So really, if you have osteopenia or osteoporosis, I like this as a nice low calcium balanced formula, and you take a little bit of extra D and K2 with it, because um, we, can't, we can't get the, the optimal nutrients. So this particular one here is uh, as an algae-based calcium, calcium from algae, so it's a plant-based source of calcium. To be honest, at the end of the day, um, there's certain calciums that are a little bit more bioavailable, a little bit more absorbable, but it doesn't, you know, the form of calcium doesn't make the biggest difference. There's a lot of talk about calcium citrate versus like, you know, calcium carbonate is bad, metal to it isn't very big, that great form of calcium in terms of bioavailability. Uh, but there's we can talk about coral calcium. Ultimately, the form of calcium doesn't make a heck of a lot of difference in terms of, uh, you know, people think if they just get the right kind of calcium, then it's all good. Um, and it's, once you absorb it and it dissociates, calcium's calcium. So uh, I like this, you know, calcium is algae-based, plant-based calcium is a nice one. That's the pure food bone structure. Does that answer calcium questions? Yes. How about the NREX formula? I'm sorry, I don't, I can't send, I don't, no, I can't send, no, I don't, I can't send familiar with that, product. Raw milk, I know it's illegal in Canada, but let's just a quick word on that. Well, the quick word on raw milk, because you know, that's a big topic, yeah. is there's no, it, what, what, just with regards to vitamin K2, there's no indication that K2, for example, is uh, damaged by heating, so raw versus pasteurized, hasn't been tested, it shouldn't make a difference. Other than that, you know, raw milk is a whole... Uh, oh, that, oh, this is a very good, this is a very good question. Um, it's hard to answer, particularly for raw milk, because the tests have been done on uh, mostly pasteurized milk. I, I, I'm a fan of raw milk myself, to be honest. But uh, studies have shown that there is a big difference between milk and fermented dairy products. So milk, is this fluid milk uh, is associated with a higher risk of fractures and <coughs> actually heart attacks, whereas fermented dairy products, consuming fermented dairy products, is associated with a lower risk of fractures. Why is that? 
Milk contains what's called galactose. It's a sugar that's quite inflammatory in the body. When you take milk and put bacteria into it and make yogurt and cheese and kefir and all those other things, that gets eaten up. The bacteria eat that and then in turn they produce good things, sometimes vitamin K2, sometimes all their own kind of nutrients. So there's actually a big difference between milk and milk products. So I'm a big fan of fermented dairy products. I'm not a big fan of milk, per se. Excuse me, the milk you're describing, the less pasteurized milk. The, the, so the research is because all done with pasteurized, pasteurized milk. milk has lactin in it. Natural enzymes take care of the lactose. Okay, so this is so a okay, not, good. I want to. It's not past, It's not lactose involved. It's pasteurization. Right, and actually, I'd like to talk to you about that afterwards because this is a, quite like an answer that I've been looking for in terms of uh, what's the deal um, in terms because I do drink raw milk, and uh, I, I want to I want to find out what more about that. Yeah, yeah, it's on. It's yeah. It's, it's on the record. Now. Everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what that means. Okay, uh, so also multis, if your multi doesn't well, you, okay. If if you're or what do you want to do this? Question here? Yes. What yeah. about um, green plus bone I I'm not familiar with the, the formula off the top of my head in terms of what's in it. So I can't speak to that. Yes. Oh no, there is a, there is a difference in the absorption and bioavailability of the calcium in in compared to citrate compared to uh, you know this glycinate carbonate. There is a difference. But once the calcium is absorbed and it dissociates, it's all calcium. After that, I don't think there's a significant difference on the impact of the calcium in your body. But if you're just looking at getting calcium in, yeah, calcium citrate's better than calcium carbonate. Uh, I like the algae-based calcium. MCHC is even better. There is a difference. There. For absorption, right? For like absorption. We're talking about absorption. Yes. Okay, so multivitamin, if your multivitamin doesn't have vitamin K2 in it, it should. Very few of them do at this point. Uh, this is the only one on the market so far that has actual meaningful amounts, 80 micrograms of vitamin K2 per daily dose. That's not as high as the therapeutic doses I've been suggesting, but it's the same kind of levels that have been associated in population-based studies with the lowest intake of, for example, heart attack or um, hip fracture or prostate cancer, these kinds of things. And then one more thing I want to mention that I sort of we could have touched on it earlier, but I'll, I'll bring it back around now. When people email me to say, uh, you know, I know I've got calcifications or heart disease or history of heart disease, um, you know, what should I do? On top of vitamin K2, I mean, there's usually a few things, K2, magnesium, um, but on top of that, or especially if they say my cholesterol is high, what do you do if your cholesterol is high? So the key with the high cholesterol is making sure it's good cholesterol or that the so-called bad cholesterol doesn't really become bad, which means that you uh, it doesn't oxidize. So the real problem what can set off heart disease is there's inflammation, as I was saying, in the body to begin with, and then your cholesterol becomes oxidized, which that's when it becomes problematic and harmful. A very simple way to deal with both of those things is with curcumin. So curcumin is a fantastic anti-inflammatory, it's a fantastic antioxidant, it's all got all kinds, there's all kinds of research coming of health benefits. Um, standard curcumin, absolutely, if you uh, enjoy having that in your diet in terms of turmeric, uh, wonderful. Uh, we know that the absorption of that, though, is, is quite low. So if you're looking at treating a therapeutic condition, you know you have high calcium or high cholesterol levels, um, then I would recommend a professional formula uh, in terms of curcumin. And theracurbin um, has been shown to be the most absorbable form in terms of it is a very, very small particle size. You take a regular curcumin and make the particles very small, which allows you to absorb it more. And so the clinical work that's now taking off with curcumin is using this kind of reduced particle form for all kinds of research uh, from everything from cancer and cognitive function, heart health, and these kinds of things. So this is a real important key in terms of uh, making sure that the cholesterol you do have stays healthy and helping deal with inflammation. Okay, so that's just something to, to wrap up the heart health side of things. Take okay. with uh, black pepper as well, I heard. 
Chicken with black pepper. Black pepper has, that's, it's, I'm glad you brought that up actually, because that's been discussed a lot. And black pepper will show to have um, a little bit of an increase, but at the end of the day, it's um, not, a, not a massive difference. Yes? Well, it is uh, the fat soluble. Curcumin is fat soluble. So curcumin is the active ingredient, the medicinal ingredient for the herb turmeric. Turmeric is a member of the ginger family. Looks like ginger, but it's um, orange inside. And uh, curcumin is the medicinal component of that. There's other components of turmeric that are give color and flavor. And uh, it's fat soluble, so having it with fat helps. But there's actually been quite a bit of research, the clinical research on the absorbability and trying to do things to make it more absorbable. And you don't see a big, big increase in that absorption of the actual blood levels until you start looking at these very small particle forms. But fat soluble, if you're going to have that in any way, like turmeric tea, for example, make sure you've got coconut oil or milk or something with fat in there. Uh, uh, coconut oil. Coconut oil, coconut oil uh, milk, fat, something, coconut something cream. with fat. Yeah. If you're just making a tea up, mm -hmm. to actually put a little bit of almond milk even, or, or coconut oil, or coconut milk? Well, I think almond milk is usually pretty low fat, but coconut oil, coconut oh, milk, so something with some fat in it to carry the recipe. Yes, so really anywhere that's calcium is building up, muscles, bone, joints, it tends to build up around the joints, breast tissue, then vitamin K2, it's got to be the first thing that you think of. Anywhere calcium is building up inappropriately. Yeah. Heel spurs, some good results, kidney stones. Yes? Uh, you talked about the removal of calcium in uh, places like arteries and stuff like that. Has there been any research or have you got any uh, feedback regarding that uh, it was able to get pulled out of things like muscles or um, places that it shouldn't be? Is mm -hmm. it more difficult to remove the calcium from some areas than others? The same, good question, the same system seems to be active throughout the body. I've had feedback about heel spurs, um, joints yes. both building and removing calcium. Can't say I've had feedback about muscles per se, it's uh, one that I'm happy to hear about if people have x-rays or, or anything else that they want to share with that. But, um, but the system seems to be more or less active throughout the body. Um, if we have abundant calcium just floating around in our body, how necessary is it to take the calcium with the magnesium? Yeah, it's the thing. I would say not at all. Yeah. It, magnesium is harder to get, and we tend to be low in magnesium. Calcium, not so much. So if you if you ever take calcium, you should always take magnesium with it. So if you want to take magnesium, don't worry about calcium. Yes. Is there um, a problem? Would there be a problem with overdosing if you had if you ate natto? And then you want to take um, that supplement, natural factor supplement as well. Mm -hmm. No, you much? can't. There's no, uh, there's no toxic amount of vitamin K2. It works very differently than other fat soluble vitamins. You couldn't overdose on it. Yes. So does K2 have any effect on like, stenosis or osteophytes? Yes. So osteophytes, similar heel spurs, essentially, uh, and then stenosis is typically a calcification of something like a heart valve, for example. So yes, it. Yeah. Oh, stenosis of the spine. Yes, um, and I'm looking, I've, I've had a couple cases, I haven't had feedback yet, but I would see, expect uh, improvements with stenosis of the spine, and I'm looking for feedback on that. Is it that bad loose spine? It's when there's a narrowing of the spinal canal and it can compress the nerve, for example. Yes. So yeah, the, the pilot who reversed his stenosis, and at the heart, so I've got uh, several cases now of aortic stenosis that have reversed their um, calcifications, and uh, three to 500 micrograms. Uh, the clinical research and the, the clinical trials are looking at around 500 microgram mark, and it seems to be the, the, the higher, those higher levels go a bit quicker. And I also like uh, vitamin D, a little bit of vitamin D with that, not a lot, but some. And as we actually mentioned a little bit earlier, um, oh, I don't have it up here, vitamin A, a little bit of vitamin A, so equal amounts of A and D. And um, basically what happens is D helps us absorb calcium, K2 moves it around the body, A takes it out of the body. So A's gotten a bad rap because it'll tell you it'll leach calcium, leach calcium. It's true, if you took a ton of vitamin A it's on its own, it would leach calcium from the body. If you take a ton of vitamin D on its own, calcium will just build up in your body. 
So A and, and or excuse me, D and A are like the gas and the brakes. You can argue the brakes antagonize the gas, but you would not want to drive your car without both. So there's a lot of vitamin A bad mouthing and vitamin A bashing. And uh, you need to have a more balanced approach to that. And um, so I like a little bit of both vitamin A, vitamin D. Where do you get vitamin A? Uh, you can get it from a weekly serving of organic liver. Nobody ever goes, yeah. used to it when I say that. Love it. It's not like that for you. Love it. Good. Yeah. Love liver. Fantastic. I like meat of not a food. The healthiest guy to the healthiest food in the world. Never makes it to the list of superfoods. So with A, is it better to supplement it? Yes, because people aren't eating liver, so you know, or cod liver oil, fine, or else, um, or else a supplement. Yeah. It gets a little fiddly because vitamin A supplements come in 10,000 IU soft gels, and vitamin D comes in 1,000 IU soft gels. So you got to do a bit of fiddling every few days with the math or whatever. But um, you, you can take a yeah. Can do the vitamin A supplement. But I like having the A, it's, it's, a, it's a triad here of these nutrients. Yeah. But if I have a shot of vitamin, I mean, of liver, yeah. just a little bit of shot of liver a week, I'm okay with vitamin A? Oh, I don't know about a shot of liver. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. I mean, absolutely, actually. Um, but it's a little bit of I'll cheer you that. Yeah. 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 I'll drink. Here's your health. Yeah, no, I would not say if, if a thumbnail amount of liver was not providing enough. No, you want a serving of liver. Yeah. You can always cook it outside. Yeah. Is this I love good, good quality so good. Good. Nice lunch, good. Nice lunch. Yes. I don't know why. I bet you got a different cover than the one Oh, thank you for telling me that. Okay. So, um,. So yes, my, my the original the book was originally published by Wiley. It had eggs and, and milk on the cover, and then it was purchased. The rights for the book were purchased by Harper Collins. They put the sexier Tower of Cheese on the cover, and uh, so it's actually the same inside. The content is the same. The content is the same. It's a reissue with the with the Tower of Cheese. And one last question. About yes. It. You talked about a calcium, yeah, calcium scan. Where would I get one? How much do they cost? Um, yeah, so you have to go down to the States. I, I, it's, you know, I'm from um, the Toronto area, and we, we're in the Toronto area, we're very close to Buffalo MRI. You can drive down to Buffalo, go to Buffalo MRI, and get one of these scans. Um, you are probably are very close to imaging centers here. If you vacation in the States, I've heard Florida, you can get them for 150 bucks. Uh, you just have to look up where, uh, uh, I don't know where the closest imaging centers would be in the U.S. And how much do they cost? Oh, uh, they can range um, from one hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars, four hundred dollars US. Wow. Um. All right. Yes. Yeah. This sounds like a really strange question, but I have calcified ligaments in my spinal stenosis. Mm -hmm. Is that related to calcium? Anywhere calcium is building up inappropriately. Uh, can be related to excess calcium, or ultimately the calcium is depositing, and you're looking at vitamin K two problems. Yeah, sounds good. So at that, I know we're, we're coming up on time, and uh, I'm happy to answer individual questions downstairs. We're also going to do a book signing. And I've, uh, before that, I've been told I have uh, three books to give away. And I, 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 I prefer doing it random, like stickers under the seats, but they made me give the books away. So to people who have been asking many questions, sure. and oh, well, here, because you love Natto, I you know, know. That. <laughs> you know what? I own it. So, you own it. Oh, so then you are free to, to pass along the I, book. I will. And I'll give it to my girlfriend. Um, <laughs> I have lots of questions here. Oh, so there's lots really of questions that I'd love to so, be so you're high in K2 or Thank you're you deficient in K2? And like I said, I'm happy to answer individuals downstairs I, I as I'm um, uh, signing books. You can also reach me through my website, www.drkmd.com. Dot com or through Facebook, no. uh, social media, <laughs> and thank you so much for your touch. You've been an absolutely great audience. Thank you, I really appreciate it.